Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to come to you again with the Caprini uh, Visiting Professor Series. And today I have a truly an outstanding individual that I've had the pleasure of working with professionally and personally for over 20 years. It's Joanne Lohr, who is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin Medical School. And then in addition to that, she went on and did a residency, University of Cincinnati. And she became interested in the blood coagulation actually with an early project as an undergraduate when she drew her own blood, looked at it with a, an electron microscope and try to look for cross-linking and trapped cells. And you know, clotting is all about cross-linking. So I thought that was really interesting. She had the good fortune to be with one of the true gurus of our, of our entire uh, thrombosis community, Dr. John Cranley, and has this tremendous expertise in vascular and venous imaging. And she produced some very important papers on venous imaging, including the importance of a bilateral scan and other things and uh, calf vein thrombosis. So I made a lot of contributions. And of course, that was just the beginning. Joanne has had a long interest in the management of DVT and PE patients, especially in women and in high risk women and during pregnancy and so forth. And of course, she served as the first president, female president of the American Venus Forum. I had the honor to follow her so I could introduce her, which was a great pleasure. And in addition to that, if that's not enough and you think I'm just changing exchanging social insincerities. Nothing could be further from the truth. She is boarded in general surgery. She is boarded in vascular surgery. She is boarded in clinical care. And she also has a certificate in wound care as well. So anyway, I'm very excited today about presenting to you one of my favorite intellectual scholars from both the clinical standpoint and the research standpoint that I've ever been associated with. Joanne Lohr, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. It's a great privilege and honor to be here today. Um, I think I can't live up to your introduction. We're going to review uh, anticoagulation of DVT in pregnancy. Um, the fact that anti tending levels matter. This is a paper that was presented uh, at the uh, American Venus Forum in March at uh, uh, virtually in 2021. I have nothing to disclose. Basically, we've had a lot of confusion about the need to follow anti-tending levels in pregnancy when, the, pregnancy when they're receiving low molecular weight heparin. There's been a lot of controversy and everybody wants to take the easy way out. This is a retrospective chart review of four young women who were being treated by other uh, providers with weight-based <laughs> unmonitored low molecular weight heparin. They all had worsening symptoms and thrombus propagation when they came to see me uh, for a second opinion. They had all received low molecular weight heparin uh, for symptomatic iliofemoral DVT that occurred in the third trimester of pregnancy. Three of them were receiving uh, VID dosing at one milligram per kilo, and one had, was uh, using 1.5 uh, every 24 hours. None of them had any anti-tending levels checked, and they all presented two to three weeks after initiation of the treatment with progressive swelling. On imaging, they had thrombus propagation, and two of the four had positional neurologic changes uh, as well as some mild skin changes. None had a, a, a therapeutic anti levels when we uh, checked them at the time of their presentation. Um, they were admitted and started on heparin uh, unfractionated uh, drips. They all required significantly increased dosing um, adjustments to become therapeutic. Um, they were converted back to low molecular weight heparin and then uh, monitored for therapeutic uh, levels of anti tenae as outpatients. They all had symptomatic improvement and stabilization of the thrombus. Pregnancy is a known hypercoagulable state. There's a five-fold increase in the risk of uh, VTE during pregnancy, and this persists for 12 weeks postpartum. This is due to increased levels of factor 7, 8, 10, von Willebrand's factor, and fibrinogen, along with decreased uh, protein S. Delivery is the highest risk of bleeding for pregnant women including a placement of regional anesthesia or C-section. You need to discontinue the low molecular weight heparin 12 to 24 hours prior to lumbar instrumentation. And this requires a team approach with your anesthesia team as well as your OB delivery team. You must know the previous uh, obstetric history of your patient. Uh, you use uh, low molecular weight heparin um, followed by anti tenate peak levels that are drawn four to six hours post-dose injection to achieve um, the therapeutic range in your uh, lab. 
So how do you monitor this? The first anti-tenant level is drawn four hours after your third or fourth dose. Um, if you're using 12-hour dosing, if you're using 24-hour dosing, it's after the second or third dose. You make adjustments by increasing or decreasing 10 to 25 percent, and then you recheck recheck your anti-tenant levels four hours after your third injection, and follow your dosing as you need it. After your dose is stabilized, the rechecking of intervals is a bit controversial. Um, I use every two weeks in the second trimester and then weekly in the third trimester. Again, it's critical you know the patient's uh, obstetric history and what their uh, delivery dates are and how, how uh, valid the uh, obstetrician thinks they are. A team approach is critical. You monitor for therapeutic effect. Remember the volume of distribution and the hormonal status changes during pregnancy. Weight-based dosing without monitoring may result in an under or over treatment. anti tenny levels are critical for safe patient management. So the current recommendations, weight-based low molecular weight heparin should be accompanied by peak anti tenny levels drawn four to six hours post uh, uh, dosing, and that's from up-to-date 2021, the deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism in pregnancy treatment recommendations. If we look at uh, uh, the um, American College and the anticoagulation guidelines during pregnancy. There are some evolving strategies, but they again center around low molecular weight um, heparin being used rather than adjusted unfractionated IV heparin as a grade 1B recommendation or not using vitamin K antagonists at grade 1A. And we recommend the use of oral direct trauma inhibitors, digatriban or anti tenny in pregnant women is at grade 1C, and this is in transition. Anticoagulant therapy should be continued for at least six weeks postpartum as a grade 2C recommendation. So VTE and obstetrics, pulmonary embolism is the leading cause of maternal death in the United States and the United Kingdom. Pregnancy is associated with a five to 10 fold increase in the incidence of VTE. The absolute risk is between 0.5 and three per thousand women. The overall risk outside of pregnancy is less than 1%. Hemodynamic changes that cause, cause uh, stasis in pregnancy and activate the part of Burkow's cow triad include increased venous distensibility, increased capacity, reduction in velocity of lower limb blood flow, and hypercoagulability. So if we look closer at this, there's smooth muscle relaxation, vasodilatation, valve incompetence, the expanded blood volume, and decreased blood flow velocity, as well as stasis. Varicose veins develop in up to 20% of young women when they're pregnant. The, uh, this increases with the uh, parity. And you can see here, uh, over 50% of multi-birth women will have varicose vein issues during pregnancy. Pregnancy also can cause compression of the iliac veins by the enlarging uterus. This increases venous pressure. The venous flow patterns are much less responsive to respiration. You can have relative hypotension. You can see decreased cardiac output. And these changes you can reverse by putting a patient on their left side down. Now, this is a, what you don't want to see. Um, and you can, again, remember that nine out of 10 women that have DVT, it affects their left limb. This isn't a pregnant uterus, but this is a woman who had complete occlusion of her cava by fibroids of her uterus. Um, so I don't have really good images of a pregnant uterus. So this I put in here just to remind everybody of May Therner the pathology anatomy of the iliac vein occlusion um, that is worsened. And here you can see the chronic changes that you can see uh, on some uh, venograms. What you don't wanna see is this. You can see a lot of pelvic varicosities and vulvar varicosities. They will frequently resolve after delivery. This was a uh, young nurse who was in her third pregnancy and this is what at post-delivery, obviously she had a C-section because you really did wanna see her try to deliver through this. Uh, she did well, and uh, unfortunately, I could never get imaging to see what her uh, pelvis really looked like. 33% of women develop vulvar varicosities, and 12% of these will persist after childbirth. Most of them come from the internal iliac uh, vein, and this leads into pelvic venous congestion syndrome with dyspareunia, dysmenorrhea, and menorrhagia. Treatment for vulvar varicosities first is delivery, ligation of the internal pudendal, and there's uh, now uh, embolization can be done. You can ligate the obturator vein, the 
veins of the round ligament. And some people, if it's really significant, may actually opt for a hysterectomy. The coagulation changes in pregnancy, again, Verkhoff's triad, all three components, vessel wall injury, hypercoagulation, and venous stasis are activated. Fibrinogen levels double in pregnancy. Factors 7, 8, 9, 10, and 12 all increase. Fibrinolytic activity is decreased. There's a 40% decrease in free protein S, which is an inborn uh, anticoagulant. Venous stasis increases. Vascular injury is associated with delivery, and there's increased platelet act activation. So again, von Willebrand's factor, generation of fibrinogen and fibrin split products are increased. There's increase in plasminogen activators. There's inhibition of the fibrinolytic system, which is a decrease in the factors uh, 11 and 12 and antithrombin 3. Again, reduction of protein S and regressive, a progressive resistance to activated protein C. Patient factors, uh, age is always a problem, and you can see that with the pretty risk assessment. 35 years in women uh, for pregnancy, obesity with a BMI greater than 29, thrombophilias, a past history of DVT, especially if it was idiopathic or associated with a thrombophilia. If they have gross varicose veins, and if they have significant associated um, medical issues, including nephrotic syndrome, diabetes, cardiac disease, and hypertension. Patient factors also uh, that we may see are uh, current infections and inflammatory processes inflammatory bowel and UTIs, bed rest and immobility, paraplegia, long distance travel, dehydration, and then our IV drug users. If they have a obstetric history that includes ovarian hyperstimulation, if they have a C-section, especially if it's an emergency, a complicated vaginal delivery, a major uh, hemorrhage that's associated with the delivery, if they're multiparous with four or more deliveries, if they had hyperemesis gravidum, preeclampsia, or if they're using estrogen to suppress uh, lactation. Again, risk factors from oral contraceptives um, can have a 2 to 0.9% uh, increased risk. Um, and if you have factor Leiden, that goes up significantly. Estrogen replacement, again, two to four times increased risk. Pregnancy in the perioperum, uh, pregnancy and postpartum, again, carrying this out for 12 weeks. So when we look at the categories of risk for women, there's a low risk if they have a family history of DVT, protein C, protein S deficiency, or heterozygous for factor live without pre prior episodes of thrombosis. There's a moderate risk if they have previous idiopathic thromboemboli, homozygous factor of five lying with or without previous events or a family history, previous DVT and thrombophilia or a family history of thromboembolism, a history of recurrent spontaneous abortion or severe preeclampsia. High-risk patients, the antithrombin-3 deficiency group, those that have combined thrombophilic defects with or without a previous uh, thrombotic event, those that have active uh, DVT or PE during their uh, current pregnancy, and additional risk factors of minimum two is age greater than 35, uh, uh, weight of over 96 kilos, and a C-section. Factors that have the highest risk for pulmonary embolism again, are the older maternal uh, women, African-Americans, a, a C-section and operative delivery, prior thromboembolic events, bed rest and immobilization, inherited disorders or uh, surgical trauma or a vaginal um, delivery that is uh, difficult. Venous dysfunction, again, that you can see after delivery persists on plexismography, the venous, venous capacitance and outflow measured at term at one week, six weeks, and 12 weeks after delivery. We see a decreased capacitance in venous outflow at term with no improvement at one week after delivery, modest improvement at six weeks, and statistically significant improvement in both of those at three months. This suggests that the, the hormonal factors rather than pelvic venous compression cause a lot of these changes. So what do we do in practice? Remember that this is the number one cause of maternal mortality in the United States and the UK. Common risk factors that you can't do anything about is the increasing age, the method of delivery, whether they have a thrombophilia or a previous um, personal history or if they're obese. Congenital thrombophilias underlie about half of the patients that get uh, DVT in pregnancy. Thrombophilia in pregnancy does not necessarily lead to a clinical event, but clinical thrombosis is a multi-causal event resulting from an interaction between the congenital and the acquired risk factors in women with thrombophilias. 
women with a single previous VT associated with a temporary risk factor and without a thrombophilia do not necessarily need routine chemo uh, thrombo prophylaxis. In women with an underlying thrombophilia or those whose VT was idiopathic, there's a much stronger case to do chemo uh, pharmacologic prophylaxis. And this is what we want to see at the end, one happy baby and one happy mom. I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive presentation. And you can see why in the introduction I was referring to Joanne as having a strong interest in the, the issues regarding pregnancy and thrombosis, especially in women, uh, both in, during and after pregnancy. Very, very interesting, Joanne. So I'd like to talk about this a little bit. So the first thing I'd like to ask you is that factor 10 inhibitor assays, activated PTT assay. Let's say that you have a patient that has a, 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 a therapeutic PTT, as you saw in your uh, example, and uh, breaks through with the breakthrough thrombosis, then you go to the 10A. But suppose you have the opposite. Suppose you have a patient that has a 10A assay in the normal range, but they're getting a PTT and it's abnormal. It's in the, the, the 10A shows therapeutic levels, but the PTT does not, and the patient breaks through. How do you explain that to the uh, average consulting doctor? Because they would say, well, if only the PTT were in the range, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have broken through. I think it's again, lab, lab error and they're measuring different things. I think that the um, patient probably has an anti thrombin 3 deficiency. So what you're telling me in shorthand here is that there are hematologic reasons why the PTT, for example, may be a shortcoming in terms of critical issues. And now we're talking about the number one preventable cause of death in, in pregnant ladies. I mean, it seems to me that we ought to be using this 10A assay in almost everybody. So the corollary of that question is, which pregnant ladies who are at high risk for thrombosis, so of course you are keeping them on low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis, do, 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 you, do you use 10As in all of them or, or what's your approach? I use 10As in everybody that's basically well and healthy. If they are admitted to the hospital with medical issues, if they have symptomatic progression, and if they're pre-delivery, usually depending on the OB, some of the OBs will tell me two weeks, some of them will tell me four weeks they wanna, or depending on what the cervix is doing, we switch to sub-Q unfractionated heparin and then we monitor the PTTs. Great. Now I'd like to discuss something else and for people who are maybe not vascular surgeons or not familiar with this, as we know, the, the, uh, there is a, a kink where the right iliac artery crosses the, just the, the junction of where that left iliac vein comes across. And so that physiologic kink can sometimes be the reason why patients who have other risk factors will get that left-sided venous thrombosis. And normally in the non-pregnant state, you would have in the right patients, you would go in and you would dilate that and maybe even stent that area and maybe use lytics to break that up. So I know you don't use lytics during pregnancy, but let's say a lady in her last trimester develops signs of a May Thurner syndrome and you treat them with anticoagulants until she delivers. How successful are you then in pursuing the uh, mechanical thrombolytic stenting scenario in a patient like that? Well, there actually has been some recent literature suggesting that we can do uh, mechanical thrombectomy and do uh, controlled lytics in pregnant women safely. Um, it's still considered high risk, um, but after they deliver, um, we've been very successful with uh, ballooning and stenting um, the lesion, especially if it's a short one and if it's the first thrombotic event. The more thrombotic events you have for the lo longer duration, the less successful you are with the uh, stenting and ballooning, although we've had good success even with complete total occlusions that are delayed in recognition. Yeah, and I think that for the audience, especially those that don't follow this closely, being able to open up that iliofemoral segment, especially in a young woman, may make the difference between how they even uh, behave the rest of their life. I know there are cases, and I know one of our uh, other esteemed colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Camarada, who's done a great deal of work in this area, always tells the story about a, an athlete that was on a scholarship 
and she developed an iliofemoral thrombosis and was treated with only anticoagulants. Nobody ever looked for a May Therner. And so instead of, and of course she lost her scholarship, dropped out of college and became a waitress. Whereas uh, it's possible that if that lady were properly treated, that she would have been able, been able to even maybe get back into sports, certainly not have to drop out of college and certainly uh, you know, move on. So anyway, this is a really, really important topic for, for these young women. Well, and it's even more important because the risk of post-thrombotic changes in that group is, is significant because of the, of the degree of obstruction and the duration of their life expectancy. I have several young women that are 20 years out from lysis and treatment for their May Therner that have normal looking legs. If you didn't know that they had that history, you would not even guess that they had a DVT. Well, Joanne, I'd like to thank you so much. This has been very, very informative. And I also feel very proud because in this particular era and this day and in our culture right now, we're trying to focus on more attention to women and, and, and getting more information about diseases that befall them. And I don't think that I've heard for a long time a dissertation with the comprehensive nature that you have given that sort of highlights for everybody about women's health issues, especially during pregnancy. So I'd like to thank you very much. And we will look forward to having you on a future Visiting Professors series. You have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you for the invitation.